let me ask you this. How many of you are parents? How many, parents? How many of you have told a child, say thank you to someone else? Say thank you, right? How many of them meant it when you told them to say that? <laughs> now think about that. Aren't, aren't we telling them to tell, say a lie? <laughs> now we're trying to teach something, right? We're, we're trying to teach something about Thanksgiving and about appreciation and the fact that if somebody's given you something, you ought to respond, right? You ought to respond hopefully with some kind of joy, some kind of love, some kind of appreciation. And so we are teaching little children. Hopefully we're not saying that to our teenagers. Say thank you. Hopefully it's the little child that's still learning the words even uh, of what thanks is. But So we're trying to model for them. But maybe that would be the best learning, right? Thank you for giving that to my son. Thank you for giving that to my daughter. That's really special of you. And the child starts hearing, oh, maybe I should say thank you too. Because what, is, what thanks really matters is the thanks that was what? That you're ordered to give, correct? The thanks that comes from your heart. Dylan said it earlier, uh, it's a heart check time. He, he had a heart check time at Christmas. Um, here as we're ending the year, we're going into a heart check time. Today, we're going to look at a um, really important text. It's the prophecy that Simeon had, that he was going to be able to see the Messiah before he died. And then he will actually speak some prophetic words to Mary, specifically to Mary. He's talking to Mary and Joseph, but he's going to zero in on Mary and tell her some things. And, and frankly, I think that one of the reasons why he zeroes in on Mary is not just because of how serious his, his prophecy is going to be, but the fact is, is Joseph's not going to be there when the prophecy comes true. We don't know exactly what happened with Joseph, do we? And, and frankly, that's, that for God's story isn't important. He's not around any longer, which probably means he died. He was probably much older than Mary when they married. That would have been normal. He could have been 35. She could have been 13 or 14 years old. He probably lived to around 50 by that time. Joseph would have been what? Excuse me, Jesus would have just about to go on to, into his ministry. We know that Mary is there alone in every encounter later after Jesus is 12 years old. So sometime between Jesus... 12th birthday, him going to the temple, and Jesus becoming an adult man and going out and doing his ministry at age 30. Somewhere in there, probably Joseph died. We know he had to live longer than just Jesus' birth. Why? Because we know that Jesus, Jesus had brothers and sisters, okay? And they came from someone. In order to be the, his brother or sister, they had to come from Mary and Joseph. So we know that family life went on for some period of time. We know that Jesus learned about being a carpenter with his dad. And so there are a variety of experiences. We just don't have details about that. But Simeon, an older gentleman himself, who has been waiting, waiting. In fact, this is an amazing thing because the Holy Spirit has come and talked to Simeon and said, Simeon, you're not going to die until you see the anointed one until you gaze with your own eyes on the Messiah. That had to be an incredible experience for Simeon because Simeon knows that it's been over 400 years since God has spoken to a single prophet. Israel's been waiting for a Messiah. Young girls are hoping they're going to be the mother of the Messiah. But here today, Simeon has been told, you're not going to die. Yet Simeon's getting old. I don't know how much longer Simeon lived after this. We, don't, again, don't know those kinds of details. Very possible that, that he was as old as Virgil. <laughs> He's, Virgil's 89 years young, folks, and doesn't, doesn't turn 90 till February, right? Child of God. Child of God, that's right. Um, and, but... But God is doing something for Simeon that is just special. A man who has believed in God, a man who has, has served the Lord as a priest at the temple, a man who has honored God in all kinds of ways has now been told, guess what, Simeon? You know what you've been waiting for? 
what Israel's been waiting for all these decades and centuries, guess what, Simeon? You're the one who gets to see him. And I'm not going to let you die before that happens, Simeon. And, and so Simeon goes to the temple probably on a daily basis. And, and who comes to the temple the day that Simeon's there? Joseph, Mary, and their little baby. Their little baby named Savior. Their little baby that they are naming Jesus. Yeshua, Savior of God. That's their baby. Now, I've got a feeling they didn't carry a sign walking up to, uh, we are the parents of the Messiah, just so you all know it here. They simply walked in. And it was the Holy Spirit that reveals to Simeon this is the Messiah. And Simeon, I, can, can you imagine? So, so, can, well, imagine Virgil running across the sanctuary, okay? I mean, you, you, try to imagine what it would have been like for Simeon to come and to see. I'm, I'm sure he, he saw him at a distance. And for him to, to come and see this little baby and, and to grab a hold of this baby. And notice he doesn't wait for the parents to say, okay, uh, hey, this is, uh, uh, we're naming our baby Jesus. Uh, uh, we're from Bethlehem, you know, like the prophets foretold. We've had shepherds out there and um, star in the north. You've seen all that. None of that happens. Simeon simply walks up and sees and knows by the anointing power of the Holy Spirit, knows that this is the Messiah. This is the anointed one. It's going to take him in his hands, probably raises him up. I know moms get all nervous about this, but boys, we got to do it, okay? Ra raises him up in the air, right? Okay? And, and holds him there and, says, and praises God for him. This gift, the Savior the Messiah, the anointed one, and blesses him with his responsibility. And, and he says some amazing things that we're going to look at in the word about him. And, and then he's going to turn and he's going to bless Mary. And, and by the way, Mary, you know, oh, I've got some words for you and they're going to hurt. And he gives them back. And who knows what Simeon does after that? But do we all know he had to be thrilled probably more than any, any parent, any proud grandparent that's holding their new baby, okay? He's thrilled because he has just held the Son of God, the Messiah, the anointed one, the long-awaited Messiah. Praise Jesus. Father God, help us to understand this word today. Help us, Lord, to hear what you want us to hear. Lord, even now, begin the journey in each of us to examine our hearts. Lord, Simeon said that, that, that Jesus would reveal what is in the hearts of the people. Jesus, you know what is in our hearts right now. You know the good, the beautiful, the bad, the ugly. You know the, the way our heart, how much devotion we have there. We, you know how much commitment we have in our hearts. You know how much passion we have for you in our hearts. You know how real our thanks, our praise is. You also know the weakness in our hearts. You know the sin in our hearts. You know the dark places in our hearts. You know the barriers uh, to rooms in our heart that we've maybe even held back from you. Your word says... And Simeon's prophecy tells us that you are going to reveal our hearts. One day we'll stand in heaven and all people will stand there at that judgment seat. And what is in everyone's heart will be revealed to the entire world, to, to all of history to know. And for those whose name is written in the Lamb's book of life because they've accepted that payment, there will be celebration. But for those who, whose hearts have said no, Simeon said there would be a dividing wall. That Jesus, you would cause the raising and the falling of many. <coughs> and sadly, there on that day, Jesus, you know that will, there will be those whose hearts said no <coughs> There, oh, they may have even stood publicly and made it look like they were before you and following you, but their hearts said no. And you 
will cause the falling and the rising of many. Jesus, give us insights into these prophecies. May they speak truth to us today. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. You're all so far away, I should probably stay out there, huh? So what is in your heart? As you're ending 2017, the year of our Lord, what's in your heart today? Um, I want you to try to be brave enough to let Jesus examine you and show you what's there. Have any of you ever um, had uh, an uh, angiogram? Some of us have had that privilege where somebody literally went inside and looked inside of our heart. Um, the, the, the day that, that I had my angiogram, I can remember um, kind of being a little bit nervous because the doctor said I was supposed to have a, quad, a, a, a bypass and, and major bypass surgery. I'm like, okay, this is not going to be fun. Um, I, I'd seen way too many. You know, as a pastor, you get to visit right after intensive surgery like this, right? I've seen way too many ribs open like this. And like, I'm not looking forward to that. And the doctors, you know, you're going to have bypass surgery. Wonderful. We're going to go in. So I'm going in first thing in the morning. They're doing the angiogram. They're starting that out. And I'm expecting that from here or the next day or sometime, we're getting the privilege of being unzipped. It's not looking, it's looking like fun. And so we're laying there on the table. And, um, and I'm kind of like going in and out. I, re- I can remember up to a point where he said, um, oh, look, Bill. Look, there's a whole, <laughs> it's, your artery's completely blocked. And, and you could actually see things. About, about three weeks later, they did the angiogram again. And this time I saw and experienced what I missed the first time. Because for some reason during the first time, I stopped breathing several times. They were having a little problem with my heart continuing. You know, I don't know. Some, some thing like and so, so I had no idea what was going on during the first one. The second one I'm watching, oh man, you can, look, you can see all that stuff moving around there. You can see right there when he's pointing and all this kind of stuff. If you've ever had that, it's kind of an amazing experience. I remember being in the hospital room the, the day after after that angiogram. And, and I have to tell you, I had an exhilaration that I've never felt before. There was something about this moment of having my heart examined that, uh, that, that touched me in some kind of unique and special way. Now, some of it, I'm sure, was just God's blessing. But, but to have our hearts open up, and I, I've seen this happen, by the way, to, to people who've had bypass surgery, uh, it, Again and again, I see a tenderizing of the heart occur for those who have had bypass surgery. For some, for some men, they get a little bit troubled by it because they start to cry at times when they don't want to, right? Just become emotional because the heart has been softened by this e- entrance into oh, their heart with open heart surgery. God wants to do that with us today. God wants to do some open heart surgery on every single one of us. This is one of those times that you probably shouldn't be looking at everyone else and saying, well, I wonder how bad their heart is, okay? I, w- I wonder what God wants to say to them. But, but this needs to be a personal moment where you're examining and allowing Jesus to examine your heart. Now behold, there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon. I'm in Luke chapter 2. It's right after the, 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 the special parts of the Christmas story. The, the angels have, have declared the, the, the birth of Jesus. The shepherds have heard the singing of the angels. Glory to God in the highest. They've gone to visit Mary. They're, they're seeing Mary and all the experiences, and they're just amazed by this. Here in swaddling clothes wrapped in a manger is, is Jesus, the Messiah. And, and the angels have told them to go and see. Mary now is pondering all these things in her heart. And now they're going to fulfill the rituals. And let's go back to the text. Behold, there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel. He was waiting for the comfort, for the healing, for the salvation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him, how? By the Holy Spirit, that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child, Jesus, to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, 
You may now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation. The salvation which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for the Gentiles, 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 Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. The NIV kind of weakens this text. No offense meant, but it starts off with the word now. The word that's actually there is the word behold. It's a word that's used to say, hey, everybody, look. In fact, it's a personal command. You, you, and you, and you, and you. Look at what God's doing. Stop and see what's happening. Something incredible is taking place, and you need to take notice of it. That's kind of lost in the word now, right? Behold, there's a man. It's, it's th- and, it, and it really includes in it this sense of, It's amazing what's going on in front of you. And folks, look now, right away. It's happening at this moment. God is trying to get our attention. Behold the Messiah. Here he is. Look. In this text, you'll take notice that God does something for for Simeon, doesn't he? Simeon, Simeon gets to hold the Messiah. God is blessing Simeon because Simeon has been a man who sought after God with his life. It's it's his intense commitment to God that's given him this privilege to now know that he's not just holding a baby, but he's holding the Messiah. It's this relationship with God that he has sought to grow and mature throughout his life that's giving him the privilege to actually be told, you're going to see the Messiah, and guess what, Simeon? Behold, Here he is. Wearsby says, Simeon was led by the Spirit and taught by the Word, and his heart was focused wholly on seeing the Savior. Simeon lived his life with a desire to see God. When he saw him, he received him and sang praises to God. Can we find a better example to follow? It's, did you see here the interesting description that Simeon gave when he saw Jesus? He sees him, and he actually says that he is salvation to whom? This is evidence that this is from God and not from Simeon. Because no Jew would say, this is all about the Gentiles. The Jews would say, Savior is about us. We're going to get rid of the Gentiles. But instead, God is revealing to Simeon, Simeon, this is salvation for the Gentiles as well as the Jews. Interesting. Who do you list first? The most important, right? And who does, who does Simeon say is first blessed? He doesn't say it the way we, even if we were going to include the Gentiles, the way we'd say it, or the way a Jew would say it is, he's going to bless the Jews, and he'll bless the Gentiles too. But the way Simeon says it is the way God's shown him, he's going to bless the Gentiles and the Jews. You guys, it's not just you that are special, but the whole world is going to be blessed through this little baby. Look at this man. And and notice, that's, that's what the text is saying. God is telling us, look at Simeon. Take a, take a strong, deliberate, intentional look at Simeon. How does the word describe him? As a a righteous man, a a devout man, a man who is waiting to see Jesus. Would you describe yourself that way? Righteous, devout, waiting to see Jesus. When we do communion, which we'll do next Sunday, what are we supposed to do every time, Paul said, every time we receive communion, what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to remember Christ's sacrifice, what? Until Jesus comes again. Therefore, every time we do communion, what are we anticipating? The return, the coming again of Jesus Christ. And Simeon was waiting to see the Messiah. Are we? 
Tozer said it this way, if the Holy Spirit was, oh, no, I went back up for just a minute. How did, how did Simeon know that he was going to see the Messiah? Did you see it in the text? The text tells us that the Holy Spirit had revealed it to him. This is the same Spirit that is going to come in Pentecost. The same Spirit that's going to anoint the church after Jesus is risen from the dead. The same Holy Spirit that the disciples are told, go back, wait, pray, and the Holy Spirit will come upon you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the othermost parts of the world. That same Spirit, the same Spirit that's poured out on Cornelius, a Gentile who has not known God and comes to know Him. The same Spirit that's going to be poured out on the Thessalonian church. That same Holy Spirit that empowers us to stand up and tell the world about Jesus Christ. It's that Holy Spirit that is already anointing. Yes, already. It's still, in a sense, in an Old Testament moment. It's still before Jesus is going to the cross. It's that Holy Spirit that's anointing and empowering Simeon to recognize this is the Messiah. And now, I'll share with you what Tozer said. If the Holy Spirit was withdrawn from the church today, 95% of what we do would go on and no one would know the difference. Did you hear that? A.W. Tozer, if the Holy Spirit was withdrawn from the church today, 95% of what we do would go on and no one would know the difference. If the Holy Spirit had been withdrawn from the New Testament church in Acts, 95% of what they did would stop and everybody would know the difference. Are we beholding a man and following his example of being filled with the Holy Spirit, of being righteous and devout and seeking after God? Well, it's time for the dedication of Jesus. Why do they do this? According to Genesis uh, 17, 12, do you know what happens when Jesus is eight years old? When he's eight years old, that's when all males get the privilege of circumcision. Eight years old. For the ge eight days, thank you. Genesis, Genesis 17, 12, for the generations to come, every male among you who is eight days old, must be circumcised. I guess some of you are listening. Including those born in your household or bought with money from a foreigner, those who are not your offering. They all got circumcised on the eighth day. Um, that would have been a, a quick thing. Um, Mary still has some other responsibilities. She's not allowed to be at the temple yet because she needs to be purified. In fact, according to Leviticus 12, 33 days after that, there's what had to happen. The Lord said to Moses, Leviticus 12, say to the Israelites, a woman who becomes pregnant and gives birth to a son will be ceremonially unclean for seven days just as she is unclean during her monthly period. On the eighth day, the boy is to be circumcised. So they probably did that on the eighth day. There is a possibility that they waited and did the circumcision with the the, the cleansing of Mary on the 33rd day, because listen on. On the eighth day, the boy is to be circumcised. Verse 4, then the woman must wait 33 days to be purified from her bleeding. She must not touch anything sacred or go to the sanctuary until the days of her purification are over. If she gives birth to a daughter, for two weeks the woman will be unclean as during her period. Then she must wait 66 days to be purified from her bleeding. When the days of her purification for a son or daughter are over, she is to bring to the priest at the entrance to the tent of meeting a year-old lamb for a burnt offering and a young pigeon or a dove for a sin offering. He shall offer them before the Lord to make atonement for her, and then she will be ceremonially clean from her flow of blood. These are the regulations for the woman who gives birth to a boy or a girl. But if she cannot afford a lamb, she is to bring two doves or two young pigeons, one for a burnt offering and the other for a sin offering. In this way, the priest will make atonement for her and she will be clean. That's the day that Simeon sees the baby. They've come to offer sacrifices for purification. They're not just there to have him named or identified. They're there to bless him and 
Now watch this next one. In accordance with Numbers 18, 15, look what else happens. The first offspring of every womb, both human and animal, that is offered to the Lord is yours. But you must redeem every firstborn son and every firstborn male of unclean animals. What do they have to do? They basically have to buy him back. That's redemption. They're buying back Jesus. They're redeeming him. Not, not, not about his sin. Just, they're saying, okay, this, this son, this firstborn son, God belongs to you. But we're paying a redemption price so that he can stay with us. These are, this is the stuff that's taking place. These are the ceremonies that are happening as Jesus is brought to the temple that day. Now then, let's look on though. What is it that actually happens? Simeon takes this little baby and said, this, is a div- this little baby is a dividing line. He's a line of demarcation. He is going to divide people who are going to be for him and people who are going to be against him. Salvation will come to the Gentiles as well as to Israelites only through this baby. This child is marked for the rise and fall of many. There are going to be kingdoms that are going to rise and support this baby, and there are going to be kingdoms that are going to fall. There are going to be those who are going to say, I believe in him, and there are going to be those who say, I reject him. He is a dividing line, a line of demarcation. He is a symbol, Simeon says, that is going to be rejected. People are clearly going to reject Jesus. When he was here on earth, and what happened? They totally rejected him, didn't they? Many of the religious leaders rejected Jesus as the Messiah. In fact, Matthew says it this way, verse Chapter 13, verse 49. This is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous. Who are the wicked? Those who have rejected Jesus. Who are the righteous? They're not perfect people, not people who have, done not, who have never done anything wrong. In fact, they're very imperfect people. They're, they're people who are counted righteous because of the salvation gift of Jesus Christ. Jesus comes to divide human history. Isn't it interesting that our calendar does the same B.C., what's it mean? Before Christ. And A.D., it's about the year of the Lord. And our calendar actually says there is a dividing line in human history before Christ and after Christ came. And Simeon prophesied that. He didn't have his calendar. He just knew this, that this little baby was the Messiah and he was special. Simeon's going to bless him. But I got to tell you, when you hear Simeon's blessing, I'm going to read it to you again in a moment. But when you hear his blessing, does it really sound like a blessing to you? Does this sound like the kind of thing you're standing there and, so, and, you're, and you're hearing him talk about your baby and, he's, and, he's, and, and this is what he says. Let's look, look at it again. Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation. That's a good thing. And if you're Joseph and Mary, saying, wow, how does he know that that his name is Jesus? How does he know that he's the Savior of God? How does he know that he's salvation? This is amazing. One more affirmation for Joseph and Mary, by the way. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations. He's a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. That's good news. Yes, our son is going to be a savior. He's going to be a light for all nations, not just for the Jews. This is wonderful. But now he turns and he makes his blessing to Mary. And this where girls, would you like this said of your child? This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel. This child is going to cause people to be pleased with God and upset at God. This child is going to cause people to be angry and literally fight over him. Oh, my. The rising and falling of many. And so that the thoughts of many hearts will be, excuse me, back up, and to be a sign that will be spoken against. And we continue to be in a world where people speak against Jesus Christ and oppose him and don't like him. And don't like his people. And they're gonna be, he's going to be spoken against. Well, I don't want my son to have people talking against him. Would Mary want that? To have people be saying bad things about her son? No way. So that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed.
and a sword will pierce your own soul, Mary. He will cause many to rise and fall. Spurgeon said of it, do you understand that? Whenever Christ comes to a man, there is a fall first and a rising again afterwards. You never knew the Lord aright if he did not give you a fall first. He pulls us down from our pride and self-sufficiency, and then he lifts us up to a position of eternal safety. He is set for this purpose. This is the great design of Christ's coming. This child is set for the fall and the rising again of many in Israel. Isaiah 8, 14 said, He will be a holy place. For both Israel and Judah, He will be a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. And for the people of Jerusalem, He will be a trap and a snare. And how many in Jerusalem will fall because of their rejection of Jesus Christ? He'll be spoken against. Isn't Jesus... The hope of the world, the joy of the Lord that's come to be with us. And yet, what is Simeon saying? Simeon says, I've been waiting my whole life to see this baby. And so Simeon's thrilled with, and full of joy, excited about this baby. And yet he knows that some people will oppose him. Some will resist him and that some still do. And he also knows that great pain is coming to Mary. In John chapter 3, right after Jesus has been talking about the fact that he has come, not to condemn the world, but that the world through him would be saved. In verse 19 of John chapter 3, Jesus says this, the verdict, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. If you're sinning, do you really want other people to talk about it? Especially if you're sinning in a way that you know is wrong. You know it's something that God doesn't like. You know that God's people would recognize it as sin. Do you really want to go and brag about what you're doing? No, you don't. You want to keep it hidden. You don't want people, even, even if you think, well, it's okay what I'm doing. Okay, I'm committing this really bad sin. I really shouldn't be doing it. But I'm trying to talk myself into it's okay. Even then, you're not going to stand up and let people see and talk about it. You want to keep it hidden. You don't want the light to shine on your sin and have people see you. It's shameful. It's embarrassing. It brings more guilt. And so we try to avoid it. So, so we try to keep our sins hidden away where supposedly nobody sees them. But Jesus is the light that shines on us and shows us our rejection. And so, so, so Simeon goes on, he says, he's going to reveal what's in your hearts. You see, Jesus knows what's going on in you right now, doesn't he? He knows how committed your heart is to him. He knows your passion for him. Again, Spurgeon, Christ's death revealed the thoughts of many hearts. Now watch this as he goes through here. It revealed the thought of the heart of Pilate that Pilate loved popularity better than the truth. It revealed the, the heart of Judas, that he loved gold better than he loved his master. It revealed the heart of Caiaphas, that he would keep to old customs rather than to the right. It even revealed the heart of the disciples that showed what poor, timid, trembling hearts they had. Even Peter's impulsive spirit was revealed in all its weakness by the death of the Savior. The cross is the great touchstone. Wherever it comes, it tests and tries us, even as the crucible tries the metal that is put into it. And let us know that manner of men we are. Dost thou love Christ? Dost thou glory in his cross? Then it is well with thee. But dost thou despise the cross? Dost thou set up thine own righteousness in opposition of it? Art thou depending upon anything beside Jesus Christ and him crucified? Then his cross reveals to be self-righteous to you and dead in trespass and sins. 
our Savior was not only to be received by men, but he was received and welcomed by women also. And so, he reveals our hearts. The point of this, you can't be neutral about Jesus. You see, Jesus draws a line in the sand. It's a dividing line, that line of demarcation I mentioned earlier. And either you acknowledge that God, that Christ is God's Son, and you submit your life to Him in absolute authority and absolute lordship, and you rise in salvation, or you submit to doing life your own way. And when you submit to that, you fall in judgment. Everything, everything hinges on this question right here. The question Jesus asked Peter near the end of his life, Peter, who do you say I am? And then he turns to Mary with this final phrase. A sword will pierce your soul. Let's move forward to the end of the story in John chapter 19. If you have your Bibles, I'd encourage you to open. John, verse 25. Now, way after the birth of this little baby, way after he's been a dedicated in the temple, way after he's, um, he's lived on earth, it's at the end. And where is Jesus? Hanging from a cross. And why is he there? dying for our sins. In John 19, verse 25, it says, Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. Where are they? Near the cross. This is not an empty cross, folks. Mary is watching as Jesus, her son, is hanging up there and bleeding to death. She's watching him be strangled, right in front of her eyes and she will watch as they take that spear and put it in his side she watches as he talks to them she hears him say it is finished she sees him grasp his last breath and return him spirit to his father she hears all the cries all the groans she watches the blood drip off of him onto the ground she sees the soldiers over here gambling for his clothing she hears the jeers of the crowd saying to him, come on, bring yourself down if you're really the Messiah. She's hearing all this ugly, nasty stuff and watching her son as he says, forgive them. She's experiencing all of this right there, just feet away from his bloody feet, watching him die. And when Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Later, knowing that everything had now been finished, and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. And Mary's standing there hearing this. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. And if you're a mom, no matter what kind of divine mission you'd been given, if you're a mom and you're watching this happen, your heart's being ripped apart. And if you're Mary, you're remembering what Simeon said. And a sword will pierce your own soul as well. And the soldier comes and he grabs that spear and they're breaking the legs of the men next to Jesus so that they simply die of suffocation immediately. And they come to Jesus and the soldier realizes he's already dead. So he takes his spear and he shoves it up inside that chest cavity and water and blood pour out and Mary's heart 
breaks because the prophecy has come true and a sword will pierce your own soul, Mary. I've wondered if Mary knew how much it was going to hurt. Did she understand the pain she was going to experience as she said goodbye to her, her son, as she watched him die like this, as she experienced him paying for our salvation. I wonder if she understood how much it was hurt. Some of you have heard me share the story of uh, the, the, the painful Christmas that, that I had when Tim was four years old. It was the Christmas that um, my mother kicked me out of her house. I'd already been living on my own, obviously. We were married. Tim's four years old. And we'd go on over because we were trying to see if there was any way. By the way, can I just tell you this? Divorce is always nasty. Okay? It always harms people. And, and the divorce of my parents' family meant that we never could have a Christmas time that was easy. I, holidays have really been f difficult for us. Because what do you do? Well, you try to go to mom. You try to go see dad. You go see the in-laws. You try to have your own family time. Oh, and by the way, you're a pastor, so you get to do church stuff too. And, 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 and frankly, the, the holidays just could, could be tough. And, I, and, and that year, I did something really brave. I went to mom and dad. And I said, could we all come to our house Bill and Debbie's house, Tim's house, and have Christmas all together. And both of them with smiles on their faces said it was a wonderful idea. And then later behind my back, they started saying something totally different. And so I'd go on to mom to say, mom, uh, you're, you're saying one thing to my face, but you're really saying something different to the brother and sisters and all. And, and that turned into a nightmare that I got kicked out. And it, it, folks, it was the most painful, but the most freeing day of my life extremely painful to have my mother telling me there to get out of the get out of her house to not come back it's all kinds of other things that she accused me of which were really accusations against my father um, just a very painful moment but it was also the most freeing thing because I had lived my life trying to somehow set my mom free somehow trying to help her I had lived for her and I had to get free of even that in order to do ministry and that, was, that day we got, we got kicked out. And as I say, most painful, but the most freeing. I felt the rejection, but I also was set free from, some, uh, from a burden, set free from a guilt, set free from something that I couldn't have been set free from maybe any other way. I wonder if Mary understood how much she would hurt, but also if she understood that her greatest pain also was her most freeing day of her, of her life. Because you see, no matter what we teach about Mary, how blessed she was, Mary needed a Savior just like the rest of us. Mary needed Jesus to die for her sins just like the rest of us. Mary need to have, needed to see him and allow him to die for her. Mary had to go through that pain and allow him to suffer so that he could pay the price that no one else, including Mary. Mary was not good enough. She couldn't do anything to get herself saved. She too had to have a savior. And on this most painful of days, it's also her most freeing day. I wonder if she knew. I wonder if she understood. Well, as I wrap up today, did, did you experience the Messiah this Christmas? The anointed one of God, the Savior, Jesus Christ, the one who died for your sins. Did you experience him this Christmas? Were you watching for him? Were you looking for him like Simeon, anticipating his arrival, hoping and praying that you got that opportunity to just to enjoy and worship him? And, and if you saw him, did you do what Simeon did? Have you talked about him? Have you told others about him? And this Christmas, if you, if you experienced Jesus, did you invite others to see him as well? Did you call, invite them to come into your home? Did you invite them to somehow get to know him as well? Because Christmas is one of the worst things for us to keep selfish to ourselves. The incarnate Son of God came to dwell among us, came to die for our sins, and then rose from the dead so that we could have life. Did you share that with anybody this Christmas? Did you share the light, because here's the thing. Jesus knows 
what's in your heart. Jesus knows what's in your heart. He knows the places in your heart that need cleansing. He knows how committed you are to him. He knows the thoughts. And the amazing thing about all that, even though he knows what's in our hearts and he's going to reveal what's in our hearts, he loves us anyways. That's grace. Let's pray. God, as we end 2017, um, there's things that we probably look back on that we're proud of even that we celebrate that we thank god that you did in our lives as a church we we surely um, are amazed by what you did in pulling together the finances to purchase the corner property and open the coffee shop wow that's a that's an incredible miracle god and so we celebrate things from the past year but there's been our challenges lord and we all know that there's things in our lives and and even the church that are not perfect Way too many empty chairs here, Jesus. So when it, way too many times that our homes are empty, that we've been embarrassed by them or just haven't invited anyone into our home. There's way too many people around us who may even say that they believe in you, but they have no relationship. There's too many broken lives and broken homes and broken people around us, Jesus. There's people in need, and you know it. And you know the times, God, that we've, that we've done nothing. Reveal what's in our hearts today, Jesus. Show us, Jesus, where we need to repent, where we need to turn something back over to you, where we need to be maybe more honest about what's in our heart as you reveal it to us. So for the next few moments in the quiet of this place, God, I pray that you would reveal our hearts to us personally. Right now, carry on a conversation with each of us, God. Show us the thing in our heart that you want to change. I pray, Jesus, that we will be open to seeing what you see. So do that now. Jesus. God is showing you some things. Some of it you've tried to maybe just ignore or downplay, but God's showing you some things. 2017 is just hours away from its conclusion. You can't live it again. You can't go back and change it, but you can repent. You, you can honestly turn it back over to Jesus. And now you can prepare for 2018. You can set your feet towards the future. You can make a commitment to, to today and tomorrow to what you're going to do to live for Jesus Christ. So forgetting what is behind, leaving it in God's hands and straining toward what is ahead, 
I pray that you will be able to press on to the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus and that nothing will get in the way, that nothing will hold you back, that nothing will hinder you, but that you, give, you, you will give your all to pursuing Jesus Christ and serving him. In the name of Jesus Christ.